What's up, YouTube? It's your boy JP. It's one of the keys, and it's too easy to remember the video today. We have the final episode of the Russia series on the Epic History TV channel. After this, I'm probably going to do the Crusades, so definitely be on the lookout for that. But let's just get it. Russian Revolution 1917. Let's just get to it. I shall never agree to a representative form of government as I consider it harmful to the people that God has entrusted for me to care. Wow, just imagine, just think about how ingrained that system of government is into people's like thought process because it's been a, a dictatorship form, like a totalitarian, a totalitarian form of government for centuries, and now people want democracy. What? You want to vote for leaders? What? It's no heirs. It's no the son of you. Had you just had to be born to be the son of the king, and now you're the uh, the son of the czar, of the king, and now you're there. In 1894, Nicholas II became ruler of a Russian empire that stretched from the Baltic to the Pacific, inhabited by 126 million people from 194 ethnic groups. It was a country in which workers and peasants lived in poverty and hardship, while Russia's elite, its imperial family and aristocracy, lived lives of gilded luxury. There was a long history of struggle in Russia against the injustices of the system. And in 1905, a revolution forced the Tsar to allow the creation of a state Duma, or National Assembly. But its power was limited, and the compromise pleased neither the Tsar nor the reformers. In 1914, this divided empire was plunged into fresh crisis by world war. all this talk about the people's confidence let the people merit my confidence <laughs> wow the, you got some big cojones my guy <laughs> very big cojones you got you, people don't you just say forget what people think this is my <laughs> I mean that's how they thought though that they've been living in luxury their whole lives they've been doing what they've been wanting to do their whole lives and now somebody wants to come and take away some of their power I mean I would feel the same way but I morally, I, would, I couldn't do that, though. World War I was a disaster for Tsarist Russia. At the front, the country suffered a series of devastating defeats. While at home, there were food shortages and economic chaos. The Tsar was held responsible for the crisis. After all, he was now the army's commander-in-chief and he was standing in the way of government reform. His German-born wife, Empress Alexandra, was even thought to be supporting Germany. While the entire family was said to have fallen under the spell of a Siberian mystic and faith healer, Grigory Rasputin. In December 1916, Rasputin was murdered by Russian aristocrats possibly with the help of British secret agents. Both groups determined to end his influence over the Tsar. Possibly, it means it was. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you even have to entertain the fact that they might have had something to do with it, then nine times out of ten, they had something to do with it. But in the eyes of many, the damage had already been done. Situation serious. There is anarchy in the capital. Government paralyzed. Chaotic shooting in the streets. But you got just think. Just think of how 
like how determined the citizens are to get their way. We're in the, they're in the middle of a world war, but yet while we're in the middle of a war war, let's have a rev, let's have a revolution in our own country. Like wow. I commend the reformers for that. Like you said forget what's happening. That was probably the, that's probably the best time to do it when the whole world is already in calamity. Like it's not like you're making a making a big fuss like I mean you still have a bigger war in the whole entire globe. So you know, like you gotta make noise. You know, like that's good. I like how they make noise during a period where there's already noise. On the twenty third of February, nineteen seventeen, thousands of women took to the streets of the Russian capital, Petrograd, to mark International Women's Day and protest over bread shortages. The next day, they were joined on the streets by workers and students carrying placards that read, Down with the Tsar. Troops ordered to put down the disorder mutinied and joined the protesters instead. Tsarist officials were arrested. Prisons and police stations were attacked. Emblems of Tsarist rule smashed and burned. The government had lost control of the capital. The Tsar was told by his ministers that order could only be restored and Russia saved from military defeat if he gave up power. So on the 2nd of March, Nicholas agreed to abdicate. In just 10 days, 300 years of Romanov rule had come to an end. Dude, that's tough though. Like, they stormed the government. They stormed, they basically told the government, man, freak you, like, F you government. E even the soldiers said, F you government. We're gonna go into the government buildings. We're gonna arrest the government officials. See, that's how you get changed. You, you, you okay? Writing the petition is cool, that's fine. Voting is cool sometimes, but you never know who can, you never, because sometimes they don't even want you to vote because they'll, they'll close down the voting polls or they'll try to make a roadblock or some or something, you know what I'm saying? Even to me, even though voting can be influenced, as you saw with the last U.S. presidential election, the voting can be influenced. So, obviously, I don't see too much faith in voting. So, the best way to destroy a system is to go at the people up top. Is to go right there and demand and forcefully get what's yours. Just like these people did. Like, they literally went into the buildings. They arrested the government officials. They forced the government to make change. Instead of, instead of just sitting back trying to write a petition or sitting back trying to Oh, let's vote, even though you're you're talking, you're trying to talk to the government who can ultimately control the results of your voting. The February Revolution had been remarkably swift and bloodless, and hopes were now high for the creation of a more democratic, more just Russian state. Members of the State Duma, the National Assembly, had formed a provisional government, which was to hold power until a constituent assembly was elected, to give Russia a new constitution. But in reality, the provisional government shared power with the Petrograd Soviet, a council elected by workers and soldiers that controlled the capital's troops, transport and communications. The Petrograd Soviet, dominated by the Socialist Revolutionary Party and the Marxist Menshevik Party, was much more radical than the provisional government. Yet it supported the government's decision to continue the war and honor the commitments that Russia had made to the Allies. It was a fateful decision that ultimately played into the hands of one of the smaller parties, the Bolsheviks. 
their leader, Vladimir Lenin, recently returned from 16 years in exile, bitterly opposed the imperialist war. He also demanded the immediate redistribution of land, from rich landowners to peasants, and the transfer of power from the bourgeois provisional government to the people's Soviets or councils that were springing up across Russia. Oh, so, so, is that, is that socialism though? Is that socialism? Because like, I feel like it's, it's so many different like things. Isn't that socialism? Like you basically, the people, the power of the people, even though the government still probably has their stake in the land, but still like, that's the, you know what I'm saying? Give the, I feel like it's always good to give the man who has the least amount of advantage give him a little bit of a leg up you know what i mean like don't sit here and prop him up to the top but at least give him a leg up like i hate the the, the cast like the, the caste system and the class system where it's like if you're not born into royalty then your life is automatic your life is going to be trash you'll never be more than you'll never be more than a peasant you know what i mean i, I don't want i don't want to do i don't like that type of system of government <laughs> The Bolshevik program was summed up in a simple slogan, bread, peace, and land. And as Russia's economic and military crisis deepened, its appeal to the masses grew and grew. In June, a new Russian military offensive ended in disaster with 400,000 Russian casualties, massive desertions, and the collapse of army morale and discipline. In July, soldiers and sailors in Petrograd mutinied. They were joined in the streets by workers with Bolshevik support. But troops loyal to the provisional government opened fire on the protesters and dispersed the crowds. A police crackdown followed, leading to the arrest of several Bolshevik leaders, including Leon Trotsky. While Lenin, with the help of Joseph Stalin, fled to Finland, traveling with forged papers under the name of Konstantin Ivanov. A socialist and stirring orator named Alexander Kerensky became Russia's new prime minister and was hailed as the man who would save Russia from anarchy. The army's commander-in-chief, General Kornilov, believed Russia's war effort was being undermined by chaos at home and deliberately sabotaged by men like Lenin, whom he declared a German spy. So in August, he ordered his men to march on Petrograd to restore order. Bolsheviks played a leading role in the city's defense against this attempted military coup. Their most brilliant organizer, Leon Trotsky, was released from prison and sent armed Bolshevik militias, the Red Guards, to defend key points in the city. <laughs> you, you got the city putting up militias against the military. <laughs> wow. So this is the full-blown military, but you got militias fighting against the military. Strikes by railway workers, many of them Bolshevik supporters, prevented Kornilov from moving his men by rail. And his soldiers began to switch sides, or simply go home. The Kornilov affair cast the Bolsheviks as saviors of the revolution. And by the end of September, they'd gained a majority in the Petrograd Soviet. In October, Lenin decided the time had come. He secretly returned from Finland to Petrograd and began preparing to seize power. On the 25th of October, the Bolsheviks made their move. Red Guards and loyal troops seized key points around the capital 
And that night, they stormed the provisional government's headquarters at the Winter Palace. An event later immortalized by Bolshevik propaganda and the great Soviet filmmaker, Sergei Eisenstein. Yo, they're li I just bit my tongue. They're literally having revolutions in the middle of a war. Like, it's not a whole nother war going on involved, like, involving 39 other countries. <laughs> you know, Russia's having its own little war within itself. Yeah, bro, the, the, the 20th century is something, I'll tell you that. Kerensky fled the city at the last moment, narrowly avoiding capture. And the next day, at the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, Lenin announced the overthrow of the provisional government. The following months saw the Bolsheviks consolidate their hold on power while fighting a brutal civil war against counter-revolutionary or white Russian forces who had foreign support. Some whites hoped to put Tsar Nicholas back on the throne. After his abdication, Nicholas and his family had been held under guard at Tsarkoye Selo, outside Petrograd, where they occupied themselves with gardening and other diversions. In summer 1917, the family was sent to Tobolsk in Siberia, where they lived under house arrest in the governor's mansion. The following spring, the Bolsheviks had the family moved to Yekaterinburg. In July 1918, as white forces approached the city, Bolshevik soldiers gathered the whole family in a cellar. The Tsar, his wife, their son Alexei, their four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria and Anastasia, as well as four servants, and executed them all. Oh, them, them Bolsheviks is not playing. Oh, that, that's, 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 so they still had the beef with the dude even after he abdicated in like 19, what was that, 1905? Over 10 years ago, he abdicated over 10 years ago. They still had beef. He said, you know what? You, you, you came back. We're going to get you out of here. Wow. Okay. They, they they held a grudge though, but I mean I can understand though if you've been if you've been under that system for three hundred years, you know like you you gotta have some sort of resentment because of the system. I mean especially if you if if your older if your older generations if all they did was they were serfs and peasants their whole lives and they did nothing else they didn't they didn't even have an opportunity to achieve more than being a serf or a peasant their whole entire life. I, I understand where they're coming from, though. Russia's civil war was one of the 20th century's most devastating events. An estimated two million soldiers lost their lives, while a typhus epidemic and famine claimed the lives of a further nine million civilians. By the end of 1921, the Bolsheviks had emerged victorious, and under Lenin's determined and uncompromising leadership, set about building a new socialist order. The Soviet Union, created in 1922, emerged as a world superpower following the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. But it would always remain a single party state, where all opposition or dissent was ruthlessly suppressed. So that's really not, so you, can, you can't even call it socialism. Of course they call it communism. Yeah, that's what it is. You, you, they say a socialist is not because you're not presenting any other ideas than what the government is giving you. So it's really not socialist. Those brief hopes for Russian democracy that flowered amid the euphoria of the February Revolution were extinguished by the Bolshevik October Revolution and put beyond reach for decades to come. Bridgman images are the leading. Alrighty. You know what I'm saying? I just.
just like learning this type of just history. Like, this is random history. Like, this stuff that they wouldn't even bother teach you about in school because, of course, my school was the American Revolution, the Civil War, slavery, the Industrial Revolution, the Civil Rights, like, stuff that almost everybody knows. Like, it's not, it's not, like, it's not, like, new information. But I like just learning stuff about this. Like, I watch a lot of historical documentaries on Netflix. Like, a lot of, of especially those on, like, like Nazi Germany. Um, like, a lot of, a lot of, like, Russia. And, like, a lot of the Russia. I just, like, watching a lot of, I like watching history. You know what I'm saying? Because it's, it's cool to see stuff that happened, like, way before I was even born. And to see how things, like, were like, how society was so much different back then. Like, it's always fascinating to learn, to, like, just get new information. Because, like, I feel like I can go and tell somebody the information. But anyway, thank you again for watching. Leave a like if you enjoy. Hit that subscribe button if you're new to the channel. Uh, go ahead, show support to um, Epic History TV because they always provide the fire content. You know what I'm saying? Definitely want to show support to them. The link to the video will always be down in the description. Thank you again for watching. Um, follow me on Instagram if you haven't. You know what I'm saying? Hit that hit the notification bell. On so you don't miss upload. Anyway, thank you again. Be safe, stay on the grind. I'm out. Peace.